you are online on LinkedIn, Mike Kadju. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody, and welcome to our live stream today. I'm just trying to get well, sorted on the LinkedIn page, but I can't see us yet. So we're just gonna get started anyways. So hello everyone, and welcome to our live discussion today. We are going global for this live stream event as I am joined by not only Mike Cadu of Procurement Foundry, but two respected supply chain professionals from Portland and all the way from Australia. It is 6 a.m. in the morning. Welcome Jono and Jay and welcome Mike. Thanks, Sarah. It's it's great to be here. It's cold and early, but I'm excited. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we are excited to be live streaming across Let's Talk Supply Chain Procurement Foundry social platform. So um, we hope that you tune in and make sure to engage with us and comment with any questions that you may have. Comment on Twitter. We're going to be monitoring that. We're going to be monitoring both LinkedIn pages as well as YouTube. So make sure you comment and ask us questions. We're going to be able to provide that out to Jay and Jono as well as Mike. Mike, Mike, Mike might be able to answer some of these questions. So we're going to throw some at him today as well. One. Just yeah, one. one. And you're not allowed to mention the word procurement. That's I've been told that, but that's a hundred dollar fine every time I say that. So <laughs> Sarah currently owes a hundred dollars toward the drinks. <laughs> and Jono might have a hidden word that he might have to throw in here at some point today as well. So look out for that, but I'm not telling you what that is. So my name is Sarah Barnes Humphrey. I am the host of Let's Talk Supply Chain podcast, blog, and YouTube, as well as the CEO of Ships. Joining me today are Jonathan Kemp. Is it Kemp or Kempy? It's Kempy. Kempy. Okay. So joining me today are Jonathan Kempy and Jay Fortenberry. They have joined forces in a couple of different areas, including a startup called Verify, which you will hear more about in our upcoming startup showcase on our one day virtual supply chain conference that's coming up on June 25th. And we are going to include the links in the comments today. So in today's session, we are talking about the new paradigm of supply chain. What does that really mean? Well, it means that we are all trying to adapt to the supply chains of tomorrow. And some of the biggest trends leading the charge on this are supply chain security, upskilling, not only at home, but abroad, so that we don't rely so heavily on China and bad data. We're going to get to bad data a little bit later on. So let me introduce you once again. This is Jono and Jay. Please tell us who you are, what you do, and what the new paradigm of supply chain means to you. Who wants to go? Yeah. Oh, sure. I'll, I'll handle that. Hi, I'm, I'm Jonathan Kempe or Jono. Uh, we shorten everything in Australia. So I'm Jono Kempe. I'm the CEO of uh, Verify, and I founded it a couple of years ago. It's a technology startup uh, based around the supply chain, uh, in particular focusing on security, transparency, and visibility. Um, the new paradigm of supply chain, it's a good question. I think it has a few elements to it, um, and perhaps after this discussion we can add a few more. Um, I think, for one, it's catapulted into the common consciousness. Uh, so supply chain now and the word, word supply chain, all the words that come along with supply chains have now become more commonly discussed. Uh, so I think we're actually seeing an elevated awareness of what supply chains are and some of their limitations. Um, so that's the first point I'd probably make about it. I, I think also with that awareness comes a desire for greater efficiency. And so people want things to move quicker and they want things to move in a way which they know is more transparent. So there's a heightened awareness about um, the ethical components of a supply chain. And subsequently, I think there's new technologies that get blended into supply chains to make it more paradigmatic. Para that is a very big word. Does that even, you know? Is that the no, hidden word? I, Did I find it? No. no. That's not could, the hidden word? Oh my God, I can't not, wait to see what the hidden the word hidden. actually is. Oh, <laughs> we could say paradramatic, which would be sort of the same. Except hey, the I like that one. I like that yeah. one. I'm going to use that in a title yeah. coming up. Okay, Jay, it's your turn. Tell us who you are, what you do, and what do you think the new paradigm is in supply chain is? So I'm Jay Fortenberry. I uh, am now a teacher at RMIT in Hanoi. I teach uh, young socialists how to be capitalist. And uh, formerly was at uh, Honeywell, uh, John Deere, Toyota, and Union Pacific Railroad. So wow. I guess the uh, new paradigm to me is somewhat some of the old is you have to manage cash. Uh, you still have to make money to stay in business. 
Uh, the business uh, through this uh, COVID, we found that businesses need to adapt very quickly to uh, re by reinventing their processes to be more nimble, uh, to be robust, expand quickly, and to use the tools that you've got already in house. Awesome. Awesome. And you guys are doing some amazing things in Vietnam. That's one of the reasons why we wanted to have this discussion today was because, you know, we're all looking, we're all talking about this. We're talking about nearshoring. We're talking about, um, you know, moving manufacturing from China. We're talking about globalization. I mean, there's some huge, huge discussions coming up about that. So um, Jay, in particular, you said that you're, you're, I mean, right now you're located in Portland, but generally speaking, you're located in Vietnam. So, and I know that you're doing a lot on the education side, as well as in supply chain, and you're doing a lot of work. Both of you are actually doing a lot of work towards a reemergence of a nation to bring alternative manufacturing options. So can you tell us about that? Jay, maybe you want to start? Yeah, I've been there three years now, and all the multinationals that I've been involved with uh, typically have uh, leadership or management from the home country. Uh, so if it's Korean, it's Korean management, uh, but they use Vietnamese labor. So one of the things that I'm very uh, intimately involved in is helping to train uh, young Vietnamese students, uh, undergrads and uh, grad students on how to be able to take over the businesses themselves and to be able to run things the way that they know how to do. They're a very uh, smart group and very uh, conscientious country. So I, I I'm very passionate about helping them get over this hurdle. Yeah, and uh, Jono, I know you've just recently, I think, started getting involved in this. What, what does that look like for you? And, and why have you, why did you get involved with this? Yeah, well, I mean, there's uh, there's obviously a shift. Like COVID is compressing some timelines, and there's a massive shift towards, um, or at least a, a, a firstly, a, a bunch of questions that gets I get asked about how supply chains work, where they're located in particular, and whether they're efficient in where they're located. And um, th that shift that's occurring uh, first will be conceptual. People will start to redesign things around what they think is a good idea. Um, but then we'll start becoming more concrete. And I think what's exciting about that is you've got certain countries, and I think Vietnam is a great example of this, that are primed and ready to do this well. They've been on this scale up uh, for some time now. Um, there's been, uh, in the Southeast Asian region, there's been some displacement of where uh, labor is located and subsequently where the factories and all the workers uh, manufacturing is located as well. And, and I think it's exciting to watch. I mean, from the Australian point of view, Vietnam's one of our, our critical mm -hmm. trading partners. Um, there's a lot of um, intra-Asian trade that happens and that gets managed. And when it comes to where manufacturing is located in a, in a macro sense, um, there is, and there's been a lot of talk about this across the spectrum, and, and some of it borders on uh, sort of ultra-nationalistic -nation terms. Others are, are more sort of regionally um, uh, promoting. And, and it's a discussion about whether or not having everything located in China is something that uh, should be revised. And, and, I, and I see Vietnam as a viable alternative um, and it's just one of a couple of alternatives that could exist in the region, um, but it's definitely a front runner and it's, it's got a stable, um, it's, got a, it's, it's a very stable country in many ways. It's, it, it's got a, a booming economy, it's got a hardworking workforce. Um, and, and so I see, see it as an exciting place uh, to consider for, uh, for alternate supply chain supply. Well, and I think when we talked about this, I think we spoke about this like a week or, or two ago, and I know, Jay, you have written a follow-up article to this, which we are going to be posting in the next couple of days as well. There is the, a middle class, I think you were saying, or, you know, where there's some chance for upskilling, I believe. What, what, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, well, the, there is a very much of a uh, middle class there that um, is growing. Uh, it's a country of 100 million people. Uh, the one thing I, I would say is that for most of, uh, for the past thousand years, they're used to having people try to tell them what to do. So it was the Chinese first, then it was the French, then it was us Americans that uh, tried to tell them exactly how to run their country. I, I think they're a pretty smart group and, and they can run a pretty good country themselves. I think all we need to do is give them a little boost as Jono likes to say, to leapfrog over some of the other economies to uh, be able to position themselves to take advantage of this. So 
but but they're they're in pretty close to being ready now. And so that's why I feel very excited about going and helping teach young people how to do this and how to, uh, uh, one of my challenges is to teach warehouse management sitting in a classroom. So I, I've reached out to some of my former colleagues to ask, you know, can I get some scanners? Can I get some other things to, to create a little warehouse within the uh, confines of the classroom itself? That's awesome. And I, is there, are, are you visiting warehouses there or factories there? Yes, I, I will do that. But I guess, it, you know, with COVID now, I'm not sure exactly what we right. can do and what we can't do. So, mm-hmm. but I did learn last night, we will be back in the classroom on uh, June 28th. Awesome. That's going to be great. And um, I think that, you know, we were, we, when we were talking about this, there's a lot of opportunity to upskill as well, because there is, and there's a lot of support from the government, I think too, Jono, right? You were having a conversation with the government the other day, I believe on something along these topics, maybe you can enlighten us on that. But also there is um, an entrepreneur's uh, mindset, right? That's starting to emerge in Vietnam that can really help, you know, push this, this forward as well, I think. Yeah, I, I think there's a, uh, there's a lot of chance there for entrepreneurial skills to be conveyed. And it's probably something that we take for granted going through our schooling system. Um, and uh, to, to speak quite starkly about it, having our parents around to learn from, um, part of Vietnam's history has been pockmarked by different conflicts. And a number of them have been affected by that. How did I learn watching what my dad did? How did I learn watching what my parents were doing for a living? Um, Some of them in the the populace in Vietnam didn't have that chance. And when you see that and then you see how that carries into education, you see that there is a real possibility for entrepreneurial skills to be learned and taught. And so people like Jay, I think, represent um, uh, just um, one of a number of options for the emerging Vietnamese middle class to learn a uh, dedicated set of skills, which will allow them, as Jay mentioned, to leapfrog past what they currently know. And so what I'm passionate about is um, ensuring that anyone that we come into contact with or that we interact with isn't just learning the same old, same old. It's no use us teaching someone in Vietnam or any other country that's going through any sort of development phase, the things that our lower paid workers are currently going through now, because they're being superseded. I mean, when Amazon is making a factory, it's not putting a a huge amount of manual labor in there that's doing manual tasks over and over again. They're looking for high levels of automation. They're looking for robotics. Mm -hmm. They're looking for different ways to use different technologies to facilitate that change. And so it would be unfair if we went into any country um, bringing any new knowledge and we just taught them something that we knew would be superseded in five or 10 years' time. What needs to happen is for us to teach them things that are, that are going to set them up uh, on a trajectory for the next five or 10 years plus, um, such that they can um, be more advanced as they go along. Yeah, building on, on that too, is we in the supply chain rarely get a seat at the leadership table. Uh, I mean, there's very few of us that have uh, made it to the CEO level, to the mm-hmm. C level. So uh, it's really teaching, what I'm doing is teaching the very basics of business to begin with, to give them a great foundation, just to teach them the balance sheet and how the supply chain impacts the uh, income statement. We have a tremendous impact on the income statement. And so it's teaching them those skills. And I, I find those skills lacking here in the U.S. too, but it's teaching those skills so that they truly understand how a business makes money. Well, and they're going to, you know, they're going to be a lot more aligned with the companies that they're working with as well, if they're able to understand and learn. And, you know, Jono, I mean, you must know what questions are coming up, because that was a really good segue with what you said, because we're also talking about upskilling today, right? And not only in Vietnam, we're talking about upskilling in general. I mean, that is a huge topic that is happening Mm -hmm. right now, um, because people and companies are looking at AI and machine learning and we're gonna we're gonna get into that but why is upskilling why is it so important to the future of supply chains and what areas do we need to look at when we're looking at upskilling um, for the future maybe you know not only just the future of supply chains but we're talking about future of business too yeah I, I, I was sitting in a lecture a couple of weeks ago and they conveyed something which I thought was uh, in, both incredible and sad uh, it was about, uh, it was a comment on, on the military. And they said, well, we have a boat ready to go. 
um, and we, we want to put it out in the water, but we don't have sailors for it. And I thought, that's really interesting. We have a, a national desire for um, defence um, and we're lacking a really critical ingredient. And I've heard similar stories in supply chains as well, where they've got resources that they want to deploy, they've got expansion plans that they want to um, make, um, but they don't, they're lacking the people to do it. Mm. Um, and part of that is going to be adjusted as COVID adjusts the world. Um, and you're going to see a shift in availability with people into certain roles, which maybe they wouldn't have considered before. Um, but there is definitely going to be a, a, a need for skills in certain strategic positions. W what is an intense privilege of my job is I get to work with people like Jay. So I, I get to be the young up and comer with the technology and the <laughs> blustery thoughts. And Jay gets to be my even keel and say, hey, you can't do that because it doesn't make sense. Or we tried that 20 years ago. Um, and, and so I see the skills gap in, I think, two different ways. One, I see it um, with hard skills that people need to learn. And those things are process skills. I think there's new technologies that are being adapted to allow those skills to be imparted a lot quicker. Um, but there's also an internal skills gap as well. Um, I, I saw a documentary recently on, on a massive ship going through the Suez Canal and the people getting on and off the boat to guide that huge ship through that tiny little canal um, a lot of those guys had a number of years under their belt. And all I could think of was who are the, who are the people who are going to replace mm -hmm. them? And if they're going to replace them and you need 30 years of experience and we don't have people in the pipeline now, how, what's it going to look like for big boats trying to navigate that small canal? Um, you, you're going to get this ripple effect down the supply chain as a huge amount of skill exits in the next 10 or 20 years. Uh, and my desire, especially being you know in that younger bracket, is to ensure that that gap isn't so large that we end up with this huge um, pronounced problem in supply chains this isn't just a bullwhip. It becomes even crazier than that. Um, so I, I'm pretty keen to make sure that upskilling happens in a way which is strategic uh, and not just, um, you know, using technology for te technology's sake, but allows us to, to solve for some of those big gaps that, that are starting to emerge. Yeah. What are you seeing in procurement, Mike? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> there sorry we go. About, sorry about that. I didn't want to. No wonder we haven't heard you yet. <laughs> it's been talking the whole time. Yeah. Mark, Mark the whole Raffin, time. <laughs> Mark Raffin, uh, one of our partners, is, is chiming in on my LinkedIn feed. And he's like, wow, you've been amazingly silent. How come I you know. Don't, uh, how come you don't do this on our broadcast? Um, <laughs> so, so certainly it's it's really intriguing because I obviously come from the indirect side a lot and, and the sourcing side. Uh, and one of the key topics that we discuss right now is the digitalization of our industry and our craft, right? And, uh, and there's a lot of that taking place across, you know, injection of artificial intelligence or machine learning uh, into the RFP process or the sourcing process and, yeah. and, uh, and, and even the digitalization of the collaboration uh, with online communities and things like that. Uh, but at the same time, it's interesting to see that the digitalization isn't just on one side of the equator. It, it's on the supply chain and on the sourcing side. Um, and it, it's, it's really intriguing to see kind of as a whole, the whole thing is moving forward. Uh, and that, you know, manufacturing may be a little bit behind that, but in a lot of ways, manufacturing is already kind of digitalized with automation and robotics and things like that. And now the management of that and the entrepreneurial spirit that's taking place in places like Vietnam uh, to, to, to upskill that community and to not keep them in the, the old way of thinking versus the new way of, you know, hey, listen, there's a lot of you know, planning and supply chain management software out there that is going to be necessary and tools uh, and, and um, machine algorithms that are going to help in that process if you're not up to speed on that, you're not setting yourself up for the future. And the same thing's happening in the procurement space as well. What I, are you, what are you seeing on that Jay with, um, you know, on the education side, are they pushing the technology button or are you sort of teaching more traditional methods, but sort of adding on to that and expanding on that? See, I've struggled with that in the education side because I'm a practitioner at heart. And I, I was a practitioner for 40 years. So I'm teaching a textbook that's completely out of date and attempting then to, yeah. uh, to expand their knowledge in this. Mm -hmm. But I, I, so I, I'm caught in between of this a little bit. 
But I, I do want to go back and say, and just kind of make sure everybody understands, we in supply chain are rarely invited up into the C-suite. And so we need to take a real effort in ourselves to truly understand how a business operates. And I'll use an example with me is that 20 years ago, my CEO at Honeywell, Dave Cody, uh, challenged us on working capital. I didn't even know what working capital meant. And so I had to go back to professor friends and ask them, it's inventory accounts payable and accounts receivable. That's how Wall Street judges a company's uh, viability is by its working capital management. So I, I, I just wanna, yes, the technologies are wonderful and we'll talk about that later, mm -hmm. but you truly still have to understand how a business operates and how, how you make money. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I think a lot of, you know, when we talk about upskilling, we, we talk about, you know, what's going to happen to jobs, right? What's going to happen to those positions when we introduce AI and machine learning and what's going to happen to the people in those positions? And what does that mean? And what does upskilling mean? And what should they be learning? I have a lot of people that come to me and they're like, what should I be learning? What should I be learning next? And I think you make a really good point with that. They should really be understanding business first. Yeah. And, and one of the things that I um, uh, wrote down to myself as a note for this was that supply chain finance is a great area for people to go in to truly understand how a business makes money because we spend a lot of money in the supply chain. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> yeah. Well, we I, I would add, add to that. There's probably there's two things that will never go out of flavor. And the first one is perception. So using intelligence to see, your, using your own noggin, to see things that um, a machine will never see, regardless of how its computer vision is augmented. And secondly, is creativity. Um, yeah. Some people say that creativity can't be taught. I think it's something that you can learn over time with a bit of practice. Because mm -hmm. um, those things won't be superseded by any algorithm. And, and they never will be. That, yeah, st strategy. There's a there's a list of things which people could focus on mm -hmm. um, to upskill into, which um, w w won't be superseded, and they won't be superseded easily, um, simply because they're human traits, um, and that's why people talk about EQ versus IQ. Uh, a, a friend and mentor of mine recently said, and it was a really good quote: "Is with the coming AI ML revolution, whatever." You, might be happening, robotics taking over the world, Skynet and all of that. Um, you, you may not lose your job. You might lose your old job. And I think that's a really good distinction. Um, you, you may not lose, your, your, you may lose your current job as it looks right now. And the good thing about that is that there's a huge amount of menial tasks that humans do, which they don't need to do. Um, if those can be automated, if those can be thrown through a computer and you have a uh, machine learning algorithm doing a lot of the heavy lifting, then the humans can focus on some of the outputs or some of the inputs, making them better. Mm -hmm. And those things can produce a better result. Um, and so the idea that we would prefer to go back to screwing bottle tops on tops of bottles, um, that's, that sort of thinking needs to be superseded because that's not what we're built to do. What we're built to do is make sure that the factory has an output and a distribution that's environmentally sustainable, um, that reaches the breadth of its potential. And all of those things are, will only be solved through creativity, perception and, and strategy. So um, if people want to look at certain things that, that won't go out of style, um, they shouldn't just focus on one unique discipline, like I should learn AI because that's the coming new normal. Um, I think they should focus on other things as well. Mike, I think you have a quick question. Yeah, I actually, somebody <laughs> just somebody just commented. Somebody just commented in my stream on LinkedIn. What about the AI to human symbiosis, right? Which is okay. I've got a machine that's going to give me some level of intelligence, but I need a human factor in, in involved with that. And mm -hmm. and and I think that that's going to be really important. Um, but I think that there's some upskilling in order to get people to the point where they can actually engage with a machine that's putting out intelli or pseudo intelligence that they can then react off of, right? Um, I wanna go back to Jay for a second because I thought Jay uh, made a great point about not understanding what trade work and capital was, right? And, um, <laughs> and, and <coughs> excuse me, one of the things that I've told people a, a lot recently is, yeah, you need to know your craft and you need to, because a lot of us in, in the sourcing side 
feel like we don't have a very good relationship with some of our stakeholders, be that the IT department or the HR department or the warehouse and logistics department, but we're sourcing on your behalf for indirect or direct sourcing, not necessarily the, the supply chain side of it, but, but at the same time, we've got what I call the peer organizations, which is finance and accounting and tax and treasury and all yeah. these other legal, right? Um, if you're not spending 20 to 25% of your time in mid to senior level management in supply chain or sourcing, I don't care which one of those two areas you're in. And I think they're starting to blend together very quickly. Um, if you're not spending 10 to 20% of your time engaged with your peers and learning what trade working capital is and what's going on inside of the legal aspects of what you're doing um, and understanding what's happening in supply chain management versus factoring versus uh, prompt payment capabilities, because there's some amazing platforms out there now to help you with that type of stuff, right? Um, that I think you're really missing the boat. And I think you have to have, I think you have to be working on those relationships as part of your, um, as part of your upskilling, right? Yeah, well, my closest uh, business partner was my supply chain finance lead. And he sat literally right next door to me. I spent most of my time in his office because what, what as you are global, I mean, whatever you're doing, you've got to involve finance. And that includes uh, compl things like compliance and things like that. And I was also the head compliance guy. So, I mean, it, that has a tremendous impact on that balance sheet. Yeah. Awesome. I, well, sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no. I was going to say right before this, my call literally right before this was one of my, was one of my old time treasury friends, you know, and I still keep those because I'm interested to know what's happening in the treasury industry in enterprise class companies right now. What are they thinking about as, as opposed to what's happening out here with the, the sourcing needs, you know, and there's, a, there's a lot going on inside of those. I mean, they're working on a lot of items because right now, like you said, I mean, you started this at the beginning of this conversation, Jay, cash is king right now. And preserving capital is probably the biggest output of what we've seen over the last couple of months. And the people who are most concerned with and whose job it is to actually manage cash are the treasury guys down the hall. Yep. Right? Yeah. And if you don't know those guys yet, you need to get a bottle of scotch and go down the hall and introduce yourself. <laughs> or wine. I mean. <laughs> most treasury guys I know drink scotch. Okay, fine. Now, <laughs> the accounts people, the accounts payable and accounts uh, receivables are, are wine people. But the, the so. Sarah, Sarah, I've got a, I've got a prop here. I, I don't want to be too uh, um, advertisey, but I just wanted to show you guys this. I don't know if you've seen one of these. Um, this is, is a this is an industrial headset that you stick on your head. It uh, mm -hmm. sits underneath a, a hard hat normally. Um, so oh, okay. Like so, um, and I just wanted to use this as an example of something that I think is an intelligent upskilling. Um, so technology brings a lot of different options to people, um, mm -hmm. but this is a this is what a system which is an, what they call an augmented reality headset, which I think is a, a good example of how technology can transform something really well. Um, this unit here, which is made by a company called Realware, has a little uh, camera on the front. You might be able to see it. It's got a flashlight yeah. as well. Um, there's an eyepiece. Um, it's, it's like carrying a seven inch tablet in your hand, um, but it's in your eye. And what it does, it overlays over your environment in an augmented reality sense. Um, uh, text or pictures or images or video and it allows you to see things that aren't there and why, why that's handy and it's a whole voice driven system is it allows you to keep your hands free uh, you can do your yeah. work you might be in a factory you might be out on the supply chain um, doing various things at a port um, and we we see these sorts of things as a good way to, to leapfrog past where people currently are because it gives them a tool on their head which doesn't just help them with their existing work as in i look at something it makes it glow so I know that I have to turn it on or I'm doing predictive maintenance so I need to check that valve before it breaks. Um, but also it puts an expert in their ear. And why I like that as, an, as a concept, and it could be this system or any other system that's available, is you have people like Jay, people have a huge amount of experience and they can sit behind the scenes and just one person can facilitate 10 or 20 people in the forward uh, leaning workforce, the guys who are out on the front line and they can communicate by a technological medium. So this has communications through a smartphone. Um, so they can be out in the field. They may not know what to do because they've only been doing it for a couple of years. And they can dial back into base and say, hey, can you see what I'm seeing? Oh yeah, I can. Okay, we'll make that adjustment or turn that, that thing or you know, adjust that spring or so on. Um, and, and I like that because it gives you a, a remote intelligent workforce. 
So you have fewer people on the front line and more people who are deployed who might have a lower skill set at least to start with, and they can be directed in the right way to go. And, and that to me is a great way of using technology, which is not just efficient, uh, it actually multiplies uh, the impact of people who have strategic skills. Well, and especially what we're talking about in COVID right now. I mean, mm. you're able to really run real-time scenarios depending on what you're what you're looking to do and where you are with people that are on the ground with less people on the ground, right? Because yeah. you could be in different locations and you could be able to uh, run the simulation and be able to figure out what works, what doesn't work, what needs to be tweaked, and you can tweak it in real time. So that's that's yeah. really great. And I know we had well, a con- we had a question from the audience. Sanjay Vadaraj asked how we can upskill, and I think we've all been able to answer that question very very well. And I just want to make another mention. Nathan says thank you, Jay, for your words about my country. Definitely, we need a push, and also good mentors like you for particular skills and knowledge. So, Jay, you are already making a difference, and I think that's what this is really all about, and why we wanted to have this conversation today. So, I just wanted to bring some of those comments into the discussion. So. You know, I know we've been talking about that. I know at the beginning I mentioned bad data. Okay. So I think we need to get into this a little bit because I've had a lot of comments about this on my LinkedIn page. Um, Yeah. We talk about data all the time. We talk about how people need to get their data houses in order. I think COVID has really shone a light on this. You know, if you don't have your data house in order, you know, you're missing out. You're missing out on a lot. You wouldn't have been able to predict some of the things that you needed to move on, um, especially right now. And so when we initially talked about this topic, Jay, you really wanted to talk about bad data because all we hear about is good data and figuring out the good data. Can you please tell everybody what you mean by bad data and what we need to know? Okay. So I have no doubt that all you guys, smart people, have programmed this thing to be amazing. I really have no doubt in that. And, and I really am amazed at what some of the stuff that Jono tells me about and things like that. Uh, where, where I want to kind of bring you back down to earth is that I'll give you two examples. I have one from an MRP, uh, which we programmed um, a while ago. And that we had inventory accuracy of 90% uh, bomb or bill of materials at 98%. And our item mass, uh, item master accuracy was at 85%. And what did that produce for me? A 75% delivery rate. So one in four, because my numbers, because I didn't take the time up front to program MRP correctly, one in four items were late. The other is a great example is we were doing an ERP and I won't say whether it was Oracle or SAP or one of those, but uh, the local team plugged in 999s in the rate fields for the parcel for UPS and FedEx. I started paying $36,000 a parcel for shipping about three months later because we didn't take the time to go back and plug the rate fields correctly. So I have no doubt the software will do exactly what it's planned to do. I have doubts in the humans that are plugging the data into the software. Yeah, so it's a human error issue when it comes to manual entry. And I'll just chuck yeah, in totally some, other, human error. Yeah, uh, some other technology options. Is it's, it's a simple case of garbage in, garbage out. So you might have a really fancy system that you've spent a huge amount of money on. And I'm sure there's people on this call and people who listen afterwards who will be looking at a project that they've gone through for a, their technology team has said, we need to get a, a team of data scientists in and they perfect this machine learning algorithm. And it's the sort of thing that's gonna transform our business because uh, when it's humming along nicely, it does this, that and that. Um, it ingests information from somewhere. It comes from somewhere. If, if that source is bad, um, it doesn't matter how clever the algorithm is, the output is going to be bad. Um, I see this in two broad ways. Um, one is just through traditional machine learning, where you've, you've got a, a different sort of algorithm that's going to make a decision at the end of the day. And those sorts of things, you know, small tweaks at the start um, or small bits of bad data at the start can lead to really horrible outcomes, predictive or otherwise, down the track. Um, the second one, which is a bit of a hot topic, is people talk about blockchains and how blockchains connect things and how they secure things. Um, 
Block, blockchains don't magically fix the bad data problem. Um, so what they will do is really heavily encrypt the bad data so it can be protected. But if it's still heavily encrypted and no one can break into it, but inherently doesn't have the output that you require, um, it's, it's really quite useless. And so when people ask questions about data, they need to uh, ask an explicit question to any of their technology team is where is that information coming from? And as soon as you've made a leap from say a, uh, an analog system that's getting a readout from an environment, uh, a classic for that is temperature. Um, if that is wrong, then it doesn't matter where it goes the rest of its journey because its origin, its genesis is wrong. Um, and so when we look at that from our technology point of view, we think about how can we create devices that give us accuracy so that downstream decisions are accurate. Um, and that's something I, I'd like to stress and for people to consider when they're thinking about any of the technology that they're trying to produce is that eventual output that I want, you know, the 50% efficiency gain, the reduction in stuff, uh, time spent on menial, whatever it might be. Um, how did you start uh, that conversation? Where did the conversation start? What, what, what was its origin? you to make those those final conclusions and someone explained this to me once and i think it's a great explanation is that people talk about uh, data reservoirs uh, versus data lakes and i think that's a great distinction because a data lake which is a common term uh, in, info, in info security is um, something which has been plonked into the natural environment it might have been formed in a natural depression in the ground um, it's prone to becoming a swamp uh, reservoirs are, are hand-picked are scientifically determined in, the, in terms of, excuse me, in terms of where they are. And also they produce fresh water that's drinkable. And so if you think about your current data lake environment, and that might be how you're acquiring data, how you're storing data, how you're transmitting data, how you're archiving data. Is it a data lake or is it a data, data reservoir? Have you, have you purposefully chosen it to do a certain function? And if so, how have you purposely constructed for that function to continue in an unfettered fashion across its lifespan? Um, and so that's, that's a pretty clear distinction, I think, that we need to focus on when it comes to how we handle and acquire data. Mike, you look like you want to jump in here. I think that's a brilliant negotiation opportunity for anybody who is <laughs> negotiating a data lake right now to call it a swamp. So <laughs> yeah. if you are in the process of negotiating your data lake for your large international enterprise uh, organization that you belong to, I think the analogy of calling it a swamp versus a reservoir is fantastic. And I think that's worth at least a 10% discount on your next data lake contract. <laughs> yeah. That's all at, I'm going to say. Least, I, at least 10, thank at you least for 10%. giving me my next negotiation tactic. I really appreciate it. Yeah. All, well, all it, it's, your... it's a really critical, it's a really critical question. And I, and I think technology guys can get enamored with, uh, you know, we've got this amazing AWS setup and it's got elastic search function so that, you know, our capacity grows as we grow and all that they'll justify an entire set of bottom line decisions, which are expensive and give you certain advantages over your competition. Um, but if the information contained in there isn't good, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. And I had the technology guys try to, they impl imp were implementing a WMS into a very large warehouse in Ohio. And they made the workers, the floor workers, relearn their whole vocabulary. And I mean, we were used to ship confirm and things like that. And they had to go out to learn a whole new vocabulary and, and it just didn't work. And so we were a total failure on that implementation. I've, I've spent uh, $750 million on an SAP and got nothing. Well, so, and this is not this SAP's was... fault. I want to say that. Okay. <laughs> well, I was going to try to transition from that. <laughs> and you're not That's alone, not Jay. SAP. You're not alone. Was, They're lining that was up. Us. <laughs> You could line up yeah. two dozen guys that would tell you the same story. Yeah. Well, and I just finished having a conversation with somebody about that exact point is that technology, we need to be a couple of steps ahead, not try reinventing the wheel and shoving it down people's throats so that they have mm -hmm. to, they have to change to conform to, to, to what we want it to be versus, you know, what the customer actually needs it to be. Um, and I think, you know, and so Mike, just quickly, Andrew Johnson. Hi, Andrew. He says, there's a hot tip for all the students listening. Get to know your Scotch whiskeys <laughs> and your treasury people, Andrew. You forgot treasury people. More, oh. more importantly, know your Scotch whiskeys and know <laughs> which people like those Scotch whiskeys. You got to make the full <laughs> supply <laughs> chain connection there. It's not good for to just know the supply source. chain. And there you go. We've just solved it right there. There's so, your procurement and your supply chain to delivery. Chain. We're done here, I think. 
but I'm still, yeah, well, and so just getting back to the data point too, and tying that into upskilling, I mean, it's something that people do want to need to learn about as we yeah. move forward, as we move into AI machine learning, what you were just talking with AR, there's so much that we more that we could be doing from a technology standpoint, companies mm -hmm. are going to need people like you with supply chain skills, as well as, you know, the data the technology, mm -hmm. understanding what that is, you're going to be invaluable to your supply chain team. So just, just mm -hmm. tying that in there with, with upskillings and what we're talking about as new paradigms, right? We're talking yeah. about new ways of thinking about this, going into the new yeah. normal. What do we need to be thinking about? How can we think mm -hmm. differently about things? Yeah. So I know that we wanted to move the conversation into visibility, transparency, um, and when you and I talked about this, Jono, when we were sort of coming up with this concept for this live, you were talking about, we need to know the history of a product before we can even start talking about security and supply chain, transparency and visibility. I mean, these are all things that we've been yeah. hearing about forever, right? These words, yeah. transparency, yeah. visibility, security, but you yeah. know, we're not really getting to the meat and potatoes. So tell us about the meat and potatoes. Why is the history of a product so important to, to those aspects of supply chain? Yeah, that's, that's a, it's a trillion dollar question. Um, <laughs> I think an illustra illustration, um, uh, like personal illustration going back to the likes of why people on our team like Jay are so important is that I will see things the way that I see them in the immediate and with my short history of time on this earth. Um, other people have a much wider perspective and a much deeper perspective. They've got more wisdom than me. They've got more experience than me. And they're the sort of people that we need to lean on to get answers from. Um, I think a very similar thing occurs when we look at how a, a supply chain is constructed and what its assumptions are and where goods start from and where they end up. Um, some people only want to know a, a certain amount of, of things about uh, that product and its lifespan. Um, they might just be consumers of it and they might not care about its origin. Um, but when we start digging through all those layers and you eventually get down to where this thing came from and what its impact was on the environment where it came from, um, you can really start to transform downstream processes and downstream thoughts and therefore downstream patterns of behavior um, simply by having a greater understanding of, of those things. I'll give you one example. Uh, it was recently made kind of famous through a Netflix documentary um, called Rotten, which some people may have uh, watched already. It's a fascinating illustration of what happens when things don't go well in a number of different supply chains. And one of the examples they give is honey. Um, so honey imported into the United States uh, technically can't get directly imported uh, from China. So it, it, it will get transshipped. It'll just get transshipped through another country and re-stamped. And so that's a question mark, and it, it causes a whole bunch of ripple effects downstream, uh, one of which is American honey suppliers or Mary, American honey importers have to check the honey to a great degree of detail. So all of the cost for making sure it's correct sits in America, but the honey's origin might be from different countries. And, and what you're trying to solve for there is like, where, where does it actually come from? That's the question you're trying, trying to ask. And to determine that, they've got these amazing genetic tests and uh, they, they look for pollen inside the honey and all of these really complicated things. And, and that's where the cost is over here. Um, but at the origin where it comes from, and it could be from China, it could be sourced from Germany or Europe, um, the country of origin just becomes dubious. You don't actually know. And so in order to solve for that, um, you've got to try and put all these like scientific and complicated steps downstream to fix something which could just be solved if the original origin question could be answered. And so we use a, the term GPS or geolocated or provenance assurance is another phrase that gets banded about. And that just uh, is able to answer the question definitively, where did this come from? And that seems like such a simple question, but for the likes of honey and rinse repeat for frozen fish, which can sometimes get transported uh, halfway around the world before and go through about four or five different countries before it gets consumed. Um, those questions are becoming more and more critical. Um, critical in two, in two ways. Um, one is it's critical because uh, if the country of origin isn't a place which adheres to our values and maybe some of their practices aren't as good in terms of cleanliness or uh, the use of certain chemicals, um, it can be really dangerous. You can consume uh, food, you can consume PPE, as is ha happening at the moment, from places um, which is producing it in large counterfeit quantities. Um, so inherently, that's really dangerous. The other concern people have is an ethical concern. They want to know that the thing that they're eating, the thing they're consuming, the thing that they're wearing, um, comes from a place that doesn't encourage slave labor. 
that doesn't encourage um, human trafficking, that doesn't exploit their workforce, that isn't involved in any of those nefarious things that we normally see hit the headlines every now and then. And, and those two things, I think, are driving changes in consumption pattern and need to be solved. It can be solved by technology. Part, part of it is a willingness of people in the supply chain across its entire length to make better decisions. Uh, another part of it is just for people to adopt um, a different technological standard uh, when it comes to finding out where things are. Uh, and lastly, I think it is a, is a way that consumers can really drive that narrative backwards and start asking those hard questions of the retailers, of the FMCG suppliers, of the manufacturers of the goods that they consume. Where did this come from? And if it came from that place, what are the conditions that it was birthed from. Um, and, and that to me is a, another data point that I think is really relevant in the supply chain, is worth protecting um, and is definitely worth promoting. Yeah, so knowing knowing the origin, knowing where it comes from is gonna help us with transparency and visibility. You talked about geolocation. What, I mean, I, I, I'm just starting to hear more about geolocation. What is that? Why is that gonna help bring transparency to supply chains? Yeah, so, um, I mean, it's a, it sounds like a really fancy term. It, it's really just trying it to is determine a very why something. Fa fancy it's term. a very, it's the sort of thing like you say, expediting instead of fast, right? <laughs> um, it's which you guys know in supply chain. Um, yeah, so uh, I mean, let, let's take example uh, the example of Australia. So Australia is a country that is girt by sea. So we are located on an island, and <laughs> yeah, in that island. I'm sorry, I have to, I have to, I have to do that. Good job. Yeah. That was my buzz. That was my buzzword, Mike. That was his buzzword. <laughs> Phil, he did it for you. <laughs> it, is, Sorry. It, is girt, it is girt by sea. So, and that's in our national anthem. It just means it's surrounded by sea. Um, but if you if you have Australian beef that's imported into America uh, or, or to Canada, uh, is it from Australia? How how do you know? Um, so some of the blockchain guys are trying to solve for this in terms of well, we make sure that there's an immutable uh, chain that tells us at this end that it came from there and so on. Origin data is sourced from a few different, a few different ways. Uh, one is by people. Uh, I was working in this factory in the middle of a rural town in New South Wales. I know I was because I'm a person and I understand the, the basic con concepts of existence. And uh, as I was working in this meat factory, I put a label on something and that label stayed with it across its journey. Maybe it was digitally tracked and so on and so forth. And I've, I've therefore established the authenticity of that, that very product. Um, there's lots of different ways technologically that you can do that, but you need it done either by people or through an automated process. But if you go through an automated process, it still needs to actually have a point that it can stake in the ground of where this came from. And so we use that with satellite technology and that's at the GPS layer, which everyone's familiar with on their phones. Um, another layer which is emerging, which I think is fascinating is low earth orbit satellites. Um, you probably heard of Starlink uh, through Elon Musk company. Um, over here, we have a group called Miriota who's pioneering um, satellite technology and a few others in the Australian uh, satellite space. Um, but what they're trying to do is give um, little tiny devices, so IoT devices, the ability to put that stake in the ground using a digital method so that when it gets tracked along its lifespan, or along its journey, that people can trace it all the way back to where it came from. Um, and so when you use GPS technology or, or Leo-based technology or you use a human component, what you're really trying to do is say, this is exactly where it came from. And as I mentioned earlier, that's it's really important for a number of reasons. Yes, and Daniel Stanton agrees with you on our Let's Talk Supply Chain LinkedIn page. He says, Jonathan Kempe is speaking my language. We need to make supply chain provenance simple and common. How about yeah. that? And, and knowing what stuff really is, where it's been and how it got there. Yeah, and, and so if you look at some of the changes that have come through, so IMO 2020, uh, as you well know, mandated a, a sulfur change for fuel types um, for boats. Um, and that was a broad sweeping change. I mean, it's been very much impacted by COVID. Um, but changes in supply chains brought about by events like we've seen. Um, some people call them black swans. And, and Jay would say, and this is, this is a great perspective from a lot of years of wisdom, that it's not a black swan. It's just another one of the, the many events that happen in the life of a, a supply chain over, over years. Mm -hmm. um, what we're seeing is an increased amount of transshipment, smaller boats going to bigger boats. Um, people are starting to use countries dynamically 
because places like Vietnam exist where they can um, offshore or nearshore or regionally move their manufacturing. If that's the case, knowing where something is or where it's come from is going to be more critical than ever. Because if you got a scenario, and I, I heard about this when we were in Singapore last year, where a large boat pulls into the port and it gets split into 42 other locations, including other boats in the harbour, yeah. that's a huge amount of division of a single shipment that needs to be tracked and therefore traced. And if you can't track or trace it, and there's a, a place in your supply chain, which effectively is a big black question mark, um, then how can you say to your consumers downstream that our supply chain is ethical, that it's secure, that it's visible, yeah. that it's transparent, that it has all of those qualities? You, you just can't. Um, and so there's got to be methodologies and ways to overcome that. Um, but I think um, geographic provenance and uh, assuring that through transshipment or, or geolocated um, shipments through other countries, um, it's going to become more and more critical. Mike? Uh, yeah. He's, he's, so, been, so, he's been dying over there. No, I see no, him. No, I have it. In and out of I have it. I just, I, <laughs> so, so before I came to corporate America, I spent about 15 years in the seafood industry. So I've shipped fish all over the world. Uh, and, and there is absolutely no question that uh, geo labeling and I mean, the, the food produce industry of the world is riddled with error. Uh, and ethical uh, activity, and and I saw that uh, I saw that show. I actually watched the honey episode <laughs> of no, Rotten yeah, yeah. because right before that was the fish episode, and I knew the all fish the fish episode. I, I know and live right where that is in the fish episode. Right. Uh, in fact, right. was a part of that industry during those years. And uh, but the honey one for me was absolutely amazing. Uh, anybody who's watching this needs to go watch that. Uh, and certainly there what, is a, what is there, it called? I'll put it. Uh, in the it's called comment. rotten. It's called rotten. And yeah. um, I don't know. Is it a, on Amazon Netflix? Original it's a, it's a Netflix, it's a net, nef, Netflix, it's Netflix? series. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's a Netflix but, series called rotten. I think it's episode two is the honey, the honey one. Yeah. And what I, what I found just, amazing okay. about the honey one was the, the quantity of honey that was being imported into the United States was like 10 times the amount of honey that could potentially be produced yeah. by yeah. all the hives in the world outside of the United States. It was like, yeah. wow, you've got some amazing honeybees in China. How are they? Yeah. Like there's a yeah. number, there's, there's a number of liters of honey that a hive can create per year. Right. And, and yeah. somehow when that left China and made its way to, I, I don't know. China, it went through or, Mal Malaysia. Yeah. And, where, and when so it went through Malaysia, it, all of a sudden the barrels from, of it. So, yeah. All of a sudden it went from like, you know, 300,000 barrels to like 4.5 million barrels of honey, right? And yeah, it was like, yeah. wow, the Malaysian honeys are, are bees are amazing. They're, they're killing they're super, it. They're super they're bees. They're super bees, bees yeah. right? Yeah, it was, it, the, the stats was one-tenth of one percent. Yeah, so the yeah. Malaysian and, honeybee can physically create one-tenth of one percent of the ship volume out of Malaysia, wow. which is just amazing because those honeybees are outperforming Every, I mean, you should buy a Malaysian honeybee. They're outperforming every honeybee in yeah, the like world. Yeah, like we only need like six of them in the Midwest, and yeah. we'll cover all the U.S. need, right? Yeah, that's all the so, waffle. All the waffle houses will have all the. Uh, you need like three honeybees, and you'll cover your need. Three. So I, I thought it was interesting, really, because and then the other part of me that thought was really interesting was the fact that they're so they're obviously cutting it, right? They're also they're obviously cutting the pure honey with some type of an extract or another product. But what's interesting is to see the, uh, the, the organizations in the United States trying to stay ahead of the people who are cutting the honey and what ingredients they're using to cut the honey with. And it's like one of the cartels how to, I mean, it, it's very similar, to, unfortunately, to the cartel cutting of, of purity of, 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 of the drug industry. And it's like, okay, you know, this is like 11% pure honey at the end of the day that's coming in in these jars. But we don't know what they're cutting the other 90% with because we can't get yeah. a chemical uh, a, a, a compound on trace. it. We can't figure out what it is, a trace on it. So they're changing the chemical. That was the really interesting part for me. And yeah, the fact oh, they, that, they, seed it, they seed it with pollen. So they'll actually yeah. get pollen from the region that the honey comes from and transship it and move it through another country, but use the origin pollen in the honey. Yeah. So that when it gets tested at the other end, they have a pollen detector. Yeah. It's like this this pollen only comes from that specific region in the middle of yeah. you know, the I mean, Swiss Alps. It, 
No, they've taken it down to the electron microscope level and it's like it's all of this just to make sure you're not buying bad honey wow amazing. who thought who knew that you know all right so we've got yeah. five minutes left and a little bit more to cover so i have a question from the audience boy uh boy Ketio says best strategies for airlines to recover from covid how does an airline industry mitigate from worldwide lockdown anybody want to take that one passenger or cargo uh, okay. Hmm? Passenger cargo. Passenger or cargo. Yeah, cargo, I guess that's a good point. Hmm? Cargo's booming. Yeah, they're, yeah. They're, cargo they, can't, booming, yeah. they can't stop. So. Yeah, it'll be the passenger side that, that we're going to have to get back up and running. And I mean, you're you're looking to get on a flight to Vietnam like in another week or so or two weeks. So they're going to slowly bring that back up and running too. Yeah, so I, I'm... I wrote a blog two weeks ago about that, and 50% of the world's air cargo goes in the belly of passenger planes. So I've also been amazed that that, that capacity is gone right now. Yeah. And until that capacity comes back, it, it's gonna the the those that own airplanes will uh, reap a lot of profits. Absolutely. Okay. And then oh. one more thing before we go, I know we wanted to talk about security, right? Cause we've heard a lot about security breaches in supply chains. This is going to be a huge part of the new paradigms because companies really need to think about this. So Jono, I'm going to throw it to you real quick. What do we need to be more sure. diligent with in our data and put, how do we put more of an emphasis on security in our supply chains? Yeah. So I, I said, there's three things to be aware of. There's physical security and that's who's getting into the boxes, who's involved in the warehouse, who physically is involved in, in shutting the doors of that container. Um, we solve that technologically using biometrics. And it's one of the things we're pioneering into the supply chain. Um, so we know exactly who it was that was involved in that process. Um, secondly, from a cybersecurity point of view, IMO 2021 is going to put a focus on that for maritime, maritime supply chains in particular. There's going to be a lot of chatter over the next couple of months about whether my boat is secure, whether the shipment was secure on the boat, whether the IoT devices attached to the shipment were secured in transit. All of those things need to be solved in a cybersecurity sense and an info security sense in terms of the transmission storage of information. You're going to start to see an emergence of specific disciplines that secure supply chain data. As in, this was information transmitted between two different disparate parties who might be commercially at war with each other and they need to still cooperate. How can we transmit the data between them and how can we keep it secure? Not just as it was transmitted, but how, as it was at rest and therefore as it was stored over a longer period of time. So physical security needs to get done well and that's layer one. That's all the way down to people, locks, doors, cyber security to a separate layer and then info security on top of that. Awesome. And just so the two of you know, I think you have upped uh, the, uh, the, um, sale of Malaysian honey or honeybees. Cause <laughs> Peter, Peter said that he bought three or no, sorry. Ben says he's bought three. Audrey says she's going to run out and buy some. <laughs> you gotta buy, well, don't buy too many. This is the problem. People flood the market with super honey. And then <laughs> it's not gonna be great. The problem is you're just buying sugar water. You just don't know it. <laughs> yeah, all right. All right. So two takeaways. What, can, what, what do we think the audience should take away from this discussion today? Two takeaways each. Jay, I'm going to start with you. Uh, supply chains are messy. The dynamics are always continually changing. Customers move. Suppliers are added. Regulations grow. Logistics costs go through the roof. So the supply chain spends a lot of cash. And so you have to manage your cash, especially right now. And then also businesses need to be very careful with what they're spending uh, at the present time and really manage your working capital with your inventory, your payables and receivables to make sure that you've got a proper cash flow so you get paid. Awesome. Mike, Mike you want to weigh in here? What are your two takeaways from this? And then we'll end with Jono and then me. Um, I think probably one of my bigger takeaways being a procurement guy who's sitting in on a supply chain channel discussion <laughs> is that we need to start to really bridge the gap a lot more between sourcing mm -hmm. and procurement. I think we're both very, very intelligent pools of individuals who come at things from different mindsets. And I think that we can certainly help each other uh, from a brainstorming perspective. I mean, we could have a whole nother conversation around blockchain and where that's going from a geo placement mm -hmm. perspective, um, because we've spent years trying to figure out how to manage software asset management. And it's, 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 it's different, but the same. 
So that's definitely one thing is I think we need to bridge the gap more and more. And I think we need to blend it together. And then obviously the second one that Jay said, which is, you know, cash is king right now. If you don't know who your treasury people are and why that's important to you, you better get on that right away. Jono, last two. Yeah, so I'd say from a technology point of view, um, ask questions of your technology people about uh, where they're sourcing their information from in terms of the data transmission pathway. Uh, where does it come from and why? That's a really big one. And I think when it comes to any technological project and blockchains are a, a classic for this, is ask what their necessary function is inside your business. Does it add to the business's core functionality? Does it detract from it? Are you spending a huge amount of money or focus uh, focused a huge amount of energy on things which are technically irrelevant to the, to the job of the business. So ask harder questions of the people who are implementing your technology. Uh, and secondly, I'd say get wisdom. Um, the hack that we have inside our company, which will stand it in good stead over many years, is that we acquire people. We find people who we um, didn't know, and I didn't know Jay six months ago, um, who know what they know, and they know it well. Um, and so if there's anyone who's listening who's my age or younger or who's involved in supply chain or technology, I'd say find people who have been there before, who've got a lot of experience and wisdom to impart and listen to them. Amazing. So for supply chain leaders, there's a lot to think about and consider as we move into the new paradigm. We hope that today we have helped provide the information in a few of those areas to help navigate through the new normal we are facing and what that means to the future of our businesses and supply chains. For me, security is a huge issue and not something we should take lightly. So coming up on May 28th at 2 p.m. Eastern, we will be going live with some more experts in this area and drilling down on what you need to know from disaster recovery to cybersecurity. So mark your calendars and stay tuned for that. Plus, remember to sign up for our one-day virtual supply chain conference happening June 25th. Jono is going to be there and he's going to tell us way more about Verify than we talked about today. It's a full day of valuable insights from supply chain practitioners. And uh, so thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you, Jono, Jay, for being live with us and Mike. Awesome. It's great to be here. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Are you just turning off the live? <laughs>